We're continuing our study through the book of Luke. We're almost finished. We actually only have four weeks of, of teaching left. We've gotten to a part of the, the text where I've already preached some of this at other times. So, so for instance, um, we've already looked at the triumphal entry back on Palm Sunday, just before Easter, uh, the part of the story where Jesus enters into Jerusalem. So here in chapter 20, he is already in Jerusalem in the story, and he's preparing for what's going to happen at the end of the week. Of course, he knows what's going to happen at the end of the week. He's, he's going to be crucified and give his life a ransom for us, for, those, uh, for the world. The people don't yet understand that. Even the disciples haven't connected all of those dots, but Jesus is there. Chapter 20 is an, is an interesting thing because in chapter 20, we, we have an interaction between Jesus and, and a group of Jewish leaders. All the people are listening in, and they're really attempting to trip him up. They're really attempting to get him to a place of, of where he'll say something wrong or say something that doesn't quite fit so that they will have grounds to dismiss him or even to imprison him or the worst case scenario which ends up happening but not for these reasons to execute him and so they're beginning this process of trying to figure this out because they are quite threatened by his presence they don't quite know what to do with him so with that we want to we'll jump into chapter 20 and we're going to we're going to consider jesus's authority if he truly has authority all authority then he is worthy of our worship he's also worthy of our obedience and our following after him so let's consider his authority as the, uh, the Jewish leaders were at this time. We'll, we'll look at this passage sort of section by section, unpacking some of the ideas in each section as we go through. So first we're looking at verses 1 through 8. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. And so Jesus does an interesting thing. He answers them with another question. And he says, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? So here he's referring to John the Baptist, actually his relative. Uh, they are um, connected by way of cousins. They, they are connected to one another by marriage. But he... He is also understanding that they don't know what to do with John. So on the one hand, they don't care for John and they don't believe him. But on the other hand, all the people love John and they appreciate his teaching and the baptism that he gave in the wilderness. So when Jesus asked this question, it puts the religious leaders in a bit of a conundrum. How will they answer this question? So they step aside. And they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say that John is from heaven, then he will say, then why don't you believe him? But if we say that John is from man, then all the people will stone us to death. For they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they gave that great answer. I don't know. That's how they answered. So they answered that they did not know where his authority came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So the first thing that, that Jesus is trying to get across to them in, in an understanding of who John was sent from God, he's trying to help them understand just as you can't question John's authority, you also cannot question his authority. You cannot question Jesus's authority. It's interesting that he begins in that first verse we see that he was teaching the people in the temple, and it says he was preaching the gospel. Now, the gospel for Jesus would have looked a little different than it does for us because we have hindsight, we have the entire Bible we can look back and see uh, as the gospel ties to the sacrifice and crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. So when we talk about the gospel, we unpack the elements. What Jesus is doing is he's talking about a future sacrifice that was going to happen. It's going to happen at the end of that week. And they hadn't yet connected all the dots. But the gospel is really the same, whether it was Jesus telling it then pre or us telling it post. The elements are the same. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with the gospel. I think often people misunderstand the gospel. On the one hand, the gospel is very simple, easy to understand, intentionally so. But, but on the other hand, I think we often come along and we add elements or we we seek through the church sometimes to redefine the gospel in ways that it was never intended to be understood. 
So let's go through these elements of the gospel. This is not in your notes, but if you want to take a side note of this, that would be great. So, so some, some ideas about what the gospel is. First of all, we have to come with an understanding that we, humanity, are made in the image of God, and we're made that way so that we might know Him and enjoy Him forever. So go back in your minds, if you know the story of the Bible, to the story of Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve were in the garden, prior to their sin, it says that they were made in the image of God, and we know that they had fellowship with God, they communed with God personally, physically, directly. And God walked with them in the garden, and he talked with them, and he intervened in their lives. But then they sinned. And when that sin happened, when they ate of the fruit that God told them not to, that sin ushered in a division between God and man that was never intended by God. Rebellion was not intended. Reconciliation was, was part of God's plan. So now he's in the process of doing that. So the first thing is we remain in God's image. Secondly, all of us have broken the relationship with God through our sin. And what we deserve because of our sin is death and hell. That's what we deserve. Whenever I'm speaking with people and they're having a particular struggle, and they're sharing with me that struggle, and, and, and the struggle is real, and they're, they're giving me kind of the details of that struggle, often they will say something like, don't I deserve, and you fill in the blank, or don't I have a right to, and you fill in the blank. Now, whatever you're going to fill in the blank with there, unless someone is mentally unstable, you're going to fill that blank in with something that brings personal benefit to the person. So, don't I deserve to be happy? Don't I have a right to a better job? Don't I, don't I, haven't I earned the right to make more money? Shouldn't my children, you know, and you fill in the blank, whatever it is. The problem with that is that it denies what we really deserve. Our sin and the presence of sin and brokenness in our lives mean, means that we deserve death and hell. So I always answer the person with the same, at the same, in the same way each time I hear that. Please don't ask for what you deserve. Because what you deserve is death and hell. If you, if you want God to give you what you deserve, I'm not sure that you will appreciate his response. But what God does through the gospel, this is the good news of the gospel. The bad news is we're sinners. The good news is, and we deserve death and hell, the good news is God gives us by way of the gospel because of what he did on the cross, what we don't deserve, life, forgiveness, purpose, direction. Thanks be to God. I don't want what I deserve. I don't even want what you deserve. I, I, don't, I want what God will give by way of the cross. So God made up for my sin by sending Jesus to suffer condemnation. And he suffered that condemnation in my place, in your place on the cross, to defeat death in the resurrection. So we have this picture of Christ that is the one who comes and places himself in our stead, meaning that he becomes the substitute for us as it relates to the wrath and the justice and the authority and the righteousness of God. So while on the one hand God loves us deeply, on the other hand he is perfectly righteous and he cannot coexist with unrepentant sin. It, it's impossible for the righteous God to do that. In fact, if he did that, he would not be good. He would be unfair. He would be unrighteous. But because he is righteous and because he is doing what is fair and just, someone has to pay the price. The theological term for that is substitutionary atonement. He becomes the substitute so that our atonement, our relationship with God can be rekindled as it was intended from the very beginning with Adam and Eve so that we can be made right with God. To receive new life from God, this is the fourth thing, to receive new life from God, all are required to confess their sin, to turn away from it, and to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. And he gives us the ability and the power to do that. So, you cannot question his authority. The gospel shows us that it is right. And he, what he did is he showed their inability to lead because they couldn't answer the question regarding John the Baptist. Okay. So first attempt, they're tripping him up, there are questions, nope, he comes out on top. Could it be 
because he's God? Yes. He's omniscient. He knows every question they're going to ask. He knows every approach they're going to take. And yet, he has a greater purpose to fulfill during this week of his life. Verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? Well, I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So here we see not only that you cannot question his authority, but also Jesus is teaching them in a way you cannot refuse his authority. You cannot refuse his authority. If he cannot be questioned, then his rule cannot ultimately be refused. Here's why. Jesus Christ is ultimate. Only one thing can be ultimate. You can't have four ultimate things. There can't be four on the top of the pile. So only Jesus is ultimate. So when you, when you think about your life, when you think about the, the struggles of your life and the issues of your life and the challenges of your life and how important some things seem, and they are important, but if Jesus is ultimate, then everything else is less important than Jesus. It necessarily happens that way. And so when Jesus is most important and he comes calling, then your response, of course, is a recognition that he has ultimate authority. Um, R.J. read already from Philippians 2 that one day he will return and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. So there is a day coming when each of us will stand before him and we will recognize who he is. Those of us who know him will certainly recognize who he is. But even those who do not know him will recognize who he is, and they will involuntarily bow their knee. And and they will not refuse his ultimate authority. So the only safe way to live is to stand on the stone. Don't be dropped upon the stone. You'll break. Don't allow the stone to be dropped on you. It will crush you. But to stand on the stone, on the foundation, who is Jesus. He describes himself here as the cornerstone. Now remember... Much of this is yet to be figured out by the disciples at this point in the journey. They, they are still uh, trying to understand what it is that he's going to do. That he, He's speaking in parables and stories. And while some of them are starting to connect the dots, they haven't all figured it out yet. But after the fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and following. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There's the picture. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the picture is that Jesus is the most important piece of our lives. And when we have given our allegiance to him by receiving that gospel message, which I just described, and receiving the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, then it changes the way we live. Well, these men... They did not see Jesus as having authority, so they're trying to trip him up. But in every turn, they are finding challenges. So now they're going to take a different approach. Okay, that's not working. As the as the scribes and the and the priest and the elders have come to him, that's not working. So, verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. Well, of course they did. In that parable, 
the tenants, the ones who kill the servants, those are the leaders. He's referring to them as the Jewish leaders. The son who is sent by the owner of the vineyard, that's Jesus. He is the son. He is sent, and at the end of the week, he will be killed. So we see this incredibly prophetic picture of what is taking place, and and yet they're not connecting the dots. But they feared the people. Remember, there's this crowd of people listening into this whole conversation. So they watched him, and they sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So what has happened is they haven't been able to trip him up in a religious way, so the religious authorities with their religious authority have not tripped him up so that the religious practices and direction could say, aha, we caught you, you're wrong, you're in trouble. So now they're, they're saying, all right, how about if we use the secular court of public opinion? What if we somehow get him to trip up and say something against the government? Rome will not like that. And then Rome could just do our bidding for us. They can take care of it. So they, they do that. They ask him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. These are the spies that they've sent in. We know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. That's not true. They don't believe that. They're making that up. They're flattering him to get his attention. Of course, remember, he's God. He's omniscient. He knows all of this. And so then they ask the question, is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, show me a denarius. Because remember, in the Ten Commandments, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. Caesar has declared himself as a god. You shall have no other gods before me. He says, show me a denarius, a coin. He takes a coin, and he asks a question, whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able to in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. It was just like, boom, mic drop. It was over. They, they, they couldn't answer anything else. They, they, they couldn't ask any other question um, to catch him and, and trip him up in what he was doing. So you cannot question his authority. You cannot refuse his authority, and also you cannot trump his authority. They couldn't get him even in the secular court. They they used the flattery in verse 21 to try to get him moving in that direction, but he sees right through it. Why? Because he's God. And so he does two things, which is really fascinating in this. He, He First of all, he affirms Caesar's limited authority. In no way does he deny that Caesar has governmental authority when he says, hey, it's got his picture on it, it must be his, give it to him. Now, any Roman standing there would have gone, great, he's encouraging them to pay their taxes. That's a good thing. How can we be mad at that? Here's a Jewish man who's supposedly this rabble rouser that they're trying to get at, and he's encouraging them to pay their taxes. So that's a good thing. And then he, he in the same sentence says, however... Those things that belong to God, belong to God. So Caesar's authority in no way takes away from God's authority. And because he is Jewish and a man of the word of God, and God himself, he is saying, of course, God's authority wins over all. And so that that stumps the spies that they send in. All right. So now they're going to try another way to get at it. There came to him some Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are a little different than the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders. In what way? For the most part, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, that group of men, those leaders in the Jewish tradition, would have been more conservative. They would have been more biblically orthodox in their views as it relates to the Hebrew Scriptures. The Sadducees, on the other hand, would have been what we would probably call today very liberal in their theology. 
they would have taken issue with a lot of the things in the Bible and said, I don't think it's really going to be exactly that way. I mean, that's not what it really means. Maybe he's talking with figurative language. We shouldn't take it literally. So it says, there came to him some Sadducees, and one of the things they didn't believe, those who who deny that there is a resurrection. So it was a known thing that the Sadducees, that group of scholars, they did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now you can already see where this is going. This is one of those exceptional circumstances that will probably never happen, but they're going to use it to try to trip Jesus up. We're going to create this fanciful, exceptional circumstance. And you'll see just how fanciful in a moment. And try to trip you up on the question Because if you believe these things, then you have to answer it. So they go on to say, they've given the the background. The word says that if a man's brother dies, he takes the wife, he raises the children. Now there were seven brothers. (laughs) Here we go. We're getting into the story. He created this interesting story. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second. And the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Now, as an aside, I would want to interview the wife at this point. Like, what in the world happened that seven husbands died? And you're still standing. But that's for another message, I guess. Verse 32. Afterward, the woman um, died, also died. So in the resurrection, so that's the scenario. They've painted the picture. Seven men One wife, seven husbands, one wife, no children. So in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be for the seven had her as wife? (laughs) Ah, we got you. Ah, we got you now. There's no way you can answer that. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So not that he used to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who had gone before him. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you've spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. But he said to them, How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? So, so the thing that we're understanding here is not only that You can't question his authority, you can't refuse his authority, you can't trump his authority, but also you cannot trivialize his authority. But but in a sense, that's what they were trying to do. So they they create this absurd story. And they try to trip him up on the details of the story as it relates to theology. And of course, he answers them clearly that you're you're focusing on the wrong thing. It's not about the marriage, it's about God. It's not about you, it's about God. And in the resurrection, we're all seen as equal, so there's no distinction. Basically, what he's saying is, who you're married to isn't a big deal in heaven. Now, I, I know that may be a shocker to some, but when Jesus is ultimate, then any connections you've had on earth, while familiar, I believe, in heaven, and, and there's sort of a so glad to see you mentality in heaven, We're there to see Jesus, not our wife, not our husband, not our children, not our long-lost grandmother or our parents. Good to see you. How's it going? Nice to see you again. There's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us. And so he's giving us this understanding of his ultimate authority. So we can approach this book because it really comes down to what we believe about Scripture. We can approach this book as a book of curiosities and objectionable materials. So, hey, let's get together, let's read a passage, and then let's debate what it's all about. That'll be fun, right? Let's do that. And and whoever wins the debate, that must be what it's about. No. 
That's not a way to approach the Bible. I've been in studies where that happens, and it's, it's laborious. It's not about debating the jots and tittles of Scripture. God is calling us to come to this book, first and foremost, that it was given to us by Him, that He is the author. Therefore, we come to this book with a presupposition that it is authoritative in our lives. And when we come with the presupposition that this book is authoritative in our lives and has ultimate authority over us, then it changes and it colors the way we look at everything. Again, not placing ourselves in the driver's seat because only Jesus is ultimate. And so we, we come to life with an understanding that it's not about me. It's about him and my connection to him, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith. So we, we come to believe that the Bible is true, that the Bible is trustworthy. And we have an example from Jesus, even in this passage, in verses 17 and 18, 37 and 38, and 41 through 44, he is directly quoting scripture himself. Just as he did when Satan tempted him in the wilderness in the early time of his ministry. If Jesus runs to Scripture, we should run to Scripture and, and mark our lives by our understanding, our knowledge, our memorization, our studying, our, our devotional aspects of Scripture. And I just want to say this to you. So at Park Ridge, we look at Scripture every Sunday. We're always going to do that, whether I'm the one standing up here opening the Word of God or someone else. We're going to open this book we're going to try to understand it more fully and apply it to our lives and give the honor and credit and glory to God because of giving it to us. But if this is the only scripture you get in a seven-day window, it's not enough. That is not enough. You're, you're running spiritually on empty if that's the case. I would encourage you, you need to be opening this book every single day, reading this book every day so that you might learn more and more and more of what God's calling you to. It used to be that, that um, church stats said, these were polls done by Gallup and others of that caliber, that faithful church attendance meant that you came at least 50% of the time to church. When we started our church, that was about the way it was. Current day stats have been refocused, they had to, because of just the reality of what the facts are. Now a faithful church attender is considered someone who comes two weeks out of eight. Now I know that that's not true for everyone, but they're looking at national averages and national numbers. Two weeks out of eight is not very often. So imagine that only two weeks out of eight, you're hearing, reading, or focusing on the Word of God, if the church you attend teaches the Word of God. That's not enough. Once every seven days is not enough. And so I implore you and encourage you, read the Word of God every day and seek to understand it and ask God for His direction on that so that you might know the Bible well. You cannot trivialize His authority. And then last, you cannot avoid His authority. Look at verses 45 through 47. And in the beginning of all the people, in the hearing of all the people, He said to His disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Hmm. Now, one of the things he's saying there is that if you're in spiritual leadership over people so in our current context that would be a pastor a pastor is in spiritual leadership over people to some extent we're all under god's authority but we have been given a role of leadership then if you are in sin and leading in a sinful direction which is what was happening with these men then you will receive a greater condemnation so that means i'm held accountable and my other pastor friends and and uh, colleagues around the world are held at a higher standard because we're in leadership. I believe that's true. I believe the Bible teaches that here. It teaches it in lots of places, especially in the pastoral epistles later in the New Testament. But what it doesn't mean is that all others will get a pass. It says that the leaders will receive a greater condemnation, but all in sin will receive condemnation because all of us will be held accountable for our lives. He began with good news in verse 1, the gospel, but now he ends with the bad news, judgment is coming. 
The good news is not good until you understand the bad. So there is a greater condemnation for false leaders, but all are condemned who live in sin and ignore Jesus. But I want to end with this. The only escape from the judgment of God is found in the truth of the gospel. Christ died to pay the penalty for our sins so we would not have to serve the sentence in hell. All who trust him live free with God as they were meant to. The challenge we have with that, my fellow human beings, is that we really like to be in charge. We really like to be in control of our circumstances. And we don't like to have to be dependent on any other process except the one we're in charge of to make things right because we feel more comfortable with that. When I was in college, I, I needed one more PE credit for my major. And so I decided during a January term of classes at, my, at our school that I would take what I believed would be the easiest credit you could ever imagine. It, we had an indoor pool. It was winter time, very cold outside. Indoor pool is where this would happen, so it's nice and warm there. And it was kayaking. I thought, anyone can kayak in a pool. How hard could that be? There's not even moving water. So I signed up for the class along with a dozen other people. I show up the first day. First, they want to make sure you can swim and all of that. And then they start putting you in the kayak and teaching you how to row. I said, this is so easy. I'm going to act like it's not, but it's so easy, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the stuff and trying to listen to everything the teacher says. You know, there are people there who've never been in a boat before. They don't know anything about the water. They're nervous. It's all good. I'm fine. Everything's good. Then they start teaching us, you know, it's a kayak. Kayaks flip easily. And so when you're in running water and they flip over, you've seen this on TV, maybe some of your kayakers. What do they do? They miraculously flip back up. How does that happen? Well, obviously, I didn't know how because I couldn't do it. So they start on the side of the pool. You'd, you'd go underwater on the side of the pool. You'd reach up to the side and push yourself up. I could do that. I was strong enough to do that. And come up and go, oh, that's cool. I like the way. That's really neat. And then they would do this thing where they would just push you out in the middle of the the pool with no oar and tell you to go under that part was easy and then flip back up and I would be there just you know under the water upside down doing this running out of air and then finally you release the thing that holds you in and swim out when you can't breathe anymore and I tried and I tried and I tried everyone in my class the little girls who weren't strong enough to shake my hand firmly, the big overweight guy who is, had, doesn't have an athletic bone in his body, everybody in my class could do the role except me. And there was no hiding. So they put me out in the middle of the pool and they said, this is our last day. You have to be able to flip the kayak past class. Easiest PE credit, not. So there I am. Everybody has already passed. They're all standing around and they're cheering for me. Come on, Eddie. You can do this, man. You can do this. And finally, 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 I did. Here was my problem. There was an involuntary response within me because I'm underwater and I can't breathe. All I want to do is what? Breathe. It's a normal thing to feel that way. The last thing out of the water in a kayak roll is the part of you that breathes. It's the last thing. If you try to make it the first thing, you'll never flip up. You have to roll yourself up so that your head comes up last. And I could not get that because I wanted to do it my way. I thought I'm strong enough. I can push my head up first and then pop up. It doesn't work that way, ever. Spiritually speaking, often we're like that. We think, we might not say it this way, but we think we know better than God. I don't want to trust in what Christ has already done for me. There's something that I need to do. I need to do this, and I, I need to read that, and I need to focus there, and I need to do these things. When all the while the gospel is, look what Jesus has done. Just trust him. Not, look what I am doing. Is it enough? That's not the gospel. The gospel is look to Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, 
and he will give you by way of grace what you do not deserve. Death and hell is what you deserve. He will give you life, forgiveness, hope, and a future. He has all authority to do that. I encourage you to trust him. Let's pray.